Hi, I'm Pastor Jerry Gerardo with Lighthouse Christian Church. And this is Ed Mabry with faithbyreason.net. Hi, Ed. Great to be with you, brother. Same here. Thank Good you so you. much for doing this uh, week in and week out. We're, we're moving forward. You're moving forward in the book of Revelation, just with extraordinary teachings, which I'm loving. Uh, just finished reviewing your video on episode seven, uh, Jesus' letter to the church in Smyrna is again another remarkable power pack letter but um i wanted to ask you if you could just lay out first for us the church in smyrna and what they were facing and how they were commended by christ sure um i love these letters because i go into so much there's so many layers of detail everything jesus said is just information packed even even the names of the churches for example smyrna uh, comes from the word myrrh we know myrrh from the the, the, the three gifts that the wise men gave to Jesus, gold, fragrances, and myrrh. Myrrh was actually, it was an embalming herb. It's an herb that only yields its fragrance when it's crushed. So Smyrna is a church that was being crushed. They were the persecuted church. Jesus' message to them was to endure persecution. And it's a message that should resonate with all of us. And the funny, the interesting thing about Smyrna and some of the other churches is that they had a different they had a, a a misconception about themselves. There were never several churches who 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 had this um, this feature in the letters. Some churches that were doing great thought they were, thought they were doing poorly, and other churches that were doing poorly thought they were doing great. Smyrna is the former. They thought they were doing poorly because they had a lot of poverty, but the poverty came from the fact that they were faithful to Christ. The reason that they were poor was because they would not worship the Caesar, the Roman emperor, and because of that because they had remained faithful to Christ, they were ostracized economically and culturally. So even though Smyrna itself was a pretty rich city, the church of Smyrna was very poor. And Jesus said to them, I know you think you're poor, but you're really rich. And what he meant by that is that Jesus doesn't look on the physical, he looks at the spiritual. So while physically they were poor, spiritually they were rich. Why? Because as the Beatitudes say, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad because great is your reward in heaven. So the more they were persecuted, the more wealth they got. And they were going to be being persecuted by the Romans. They were being persecuted by these people who Jesus talks about who said they were Jews, but weren't actually Jews, but were of a synagogue of Satan, doing some kind of satanic worship under the name of Judaism. And I, I guess my ideas of who they might be in this video, and we'll talk about them again, because we'll see these folks appear again in the letter to Philadelphia. So I think it's worth a deeper dive since Jesus mentioned them twice. But again, I talk a little bit about them um, in this. And yeah, I just talk about how Jesus's message to them is, I'm not going to save you from the persecution. Endure and you'll get, a, get the crown of life. And you might ask, why wouldn't Jesus rescue this church? Because this is one of the two churches that he has nothing negative to say about them. They get all A's in their report card. He just says, hang in there. But keep in mind that, again, Jesus is fo focused on the spiritual. And if Jesus had stopped their persecution, he would have stopped their reward. And that would have been unjust. Because let's think about it. We, how, how long are we here on earth? You know, if we're lucky, 70, 80, 90 years, how long is eternity? It's forever. So what's more important? suffering now or eternal riches. So if Jesus is saying, you know what, I hate that this is happening to my church, I'm gonna stop their suffering now. What he'd be saying is that I'm gonna, I'm gonna limit your eternal reward and he would never do that. So that's why he permits it, but he, he promises them great treasure in heaven. Wow, that is so well laid out. And I think in our humanity, so often we're looking to avoid suffering. Uh, we wouldn't sign up for persecution, of course, but God does something remarkable as we stay faithful to him through the testing, which can even extend to very serious persecution and even martyrdom for, for the apostles and many throughout uh, history who are true followers of Christ in areas where there's tremendous persecution. So I think this gives us a completely different take on it, which is the truth, because it's from Christ's vantage point about the rewards. I really appreciate hearing that. And I think it can help any one of us when we're facing persecution to hold up, honor Christ, and know that greater rewards are coming, not just now, but in the future, in the eternity with Christ. That's awesome, man. I love it. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more, you know, about how this letter can, um, you know, how we can process it and how it affects us personally and prophetically and the impact on the church throughout history. 
Sure, because again, all these letters appeal to, to us on different levels. There was historic, which I just talked about, the actual church in, in ancient Smyrna, but also it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this is for us personally and for us on a church level. And we, we experience persecution. In fact, if you're a Christian, it's non-negotiable. You are going to be persecuted. Jesus says it more than once in the epistles. We talk about, the epistles talk about how we are going to be persecuted. It's not optional. In fact, I would say to you, if you're not being persecuted, you might ask yourself whether or not you're really a Christian or, or to what degree you're expressing your Christianity because you are going to be persecuted because we are not, we're in this world, but not of this world. So we should expect it. And, you know, and, and we get it Throughout history, as you said, you said, the church has always been persecuted from day one. And even to this day, if you look at some of the churches around the world, in China, physical persecution. Indonesia, you're persecuted for being a Christian. In, in any country that has a, a dominant Muslim population, you're going to be persecuted. Many parts of Africa, physical persecution. And these churches are still enduring and they're growing. But the reason, they, the reason they're growing is because the church always grows during persecution. Why? Because when you're being persecuted, you have nothing to rely on. Um, except for God. And so that, that makes that makes it stronger. That makes your relationship with him stronger. And but even in the West, even though we aren't necessarily experiencing physical persecution, at least not yet, <laughs> hopefully it'll remain that way, but we endure cultural persecution and social persecution. I mean, it wasn't too long ago in my lifetime, when I was growing up as a kid, when you were a, a Christian or a blink, went to church, you were, that was considered a positive. If you, if you told someone you're a Christian, they said, oh, okay, you must be a good person because you're a Christian. If you're a pastor, oh, you, you're a leader of the community. You're, you're the pillar of the community. Politicians would have to at least nominally claim to be Christian in order to even be elected. <laughs> that, how that's changed. The church is no longer looked at a, as a place of refuge anymore. When you, I think as recently as the 9-11 attacks in 2001, you had people flocking to the church because... Yeah. Even if they weren't Christian, they would flock to the church because they wanted to get some type of message of hope. They, they were confused. They were frightened. So they went to the church. Again, that was about 20 years ago. But how things have changed where now, if you are a Christian, you're not considered a good person. You're considered a bad person. You're considered to be a bigot. You're considered mm. to be um, homophobic. You're considered yeah. anti-women's rights. Yeah. If you're a pastor, you're considered to be an abuser. We're considered yeah. anti-intellectual because we, as Christians... If you're a true Christian, you don't believe in the actual, this ludicrous theory of evolution. And I'm just going to, little rant really quick, because this is something that's close to my heart. Um, I, this theory of evolution, which is not science, we're going to talk about something that's anti-science. Let's talk about evolution. And the reason I want to point this out is because I, I have a passion for helping young people um, understand their faith and understand why their faith is real, as opposed to the quasi science of stuff called of, of, of this Darwinian evolution. So if you go to faithbyreason.net, go to that side of categories menu on, on on the right side and click on evolution versus creationism. I've got, I got three full podcasts where I go into detail on why mm. it isn't just a bad theory; it is a ludicrous theory based on science alone. Not not even bringing in the Bible. It's just a bad theory that we're forced to accept. And I want to give young people the tools to have hope in their own faith and to combat people who come against them. And it's, and it's personal to me because when I went to college, I just got battered uh, by, by people telling me that God wasn't real, that biology and evolution has disproved God. And, I, and, and my church did not prepare me for it. So I have a passion mm -hmm. for, for that. So if you have a, a teenager, preteen, college, uh, send them to faithbyreason.net and have them look that up. Anyway, getting back, back yes. to the point is that we endure that kind of persecution. You can't, Jerry, you know, you can't watch television even go, or even see a movie without there being some kind of anti-Christian message. And I, even if the show has, or the, or the movie has nothing to do with religion, they'll just find a way to put in a dig against <laughs> stupid Christians or bigoted Christians or the bad guy in the movie is a religious person or, you right. know, Right. Or they're a hypocrite or something like that. So the whole point is we're enduring this persecution culturally and socially where we are now the pariahs of society, even in this so-called tolerant age where everything is tolerated except us. You, can, you yeah. can't say anything bad about anyone's sexuality or their transgenderism. You can't say anything bad about anyone racially or culturally. The only thing that's safe to, for, the, us to, for um, cultural abuse is Christianity. You can get away with that. You can say anything you want about Christians, just about no one else. And that is frankly satanic. Yeah. But here's the thing about um, Satan and his ultimate failure. The more he abuses the church, the more the church grows. 
and we talked about prophetically from a prophetic standpoint i believe that these seven letters in the order in which they were written lay out church history in advance so the church at ephesus was the apostolic age of the first couple centuries and so i believe that these church at smyrna is the age of persecution which is kind of overlaps with it maybe through the first second and third century now the church had been persecuted from the day from day one mostly by some of the jewish people so the jewish leaders who didn't like the message of christ paul being he being an example of someone who persecuted the church before he was right. converted <clears throat> but this era specifically is when the roman empire um took over the the reins of abuse and furiously persecuted the church with names like hadrian the emperors like hadrian marcus aurelius Diocletian, who really tried to wipe the Christians out. And again, it was satanic. It was Satan's way of saying, I'm gonna wipe these Christians out, but it completely backfired on him because the more the church was persecuted, the more the church grew. There's a saying that the 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 the, the growth of the church was watered by the blood of the martyrs. That was a little morbid saying, but it's true. And that the more the church was driven underground, the more it grew. And sometimes, that's sometimes that's the reason why God allows persecution because we get lazy intellectually and spiritually, and but that when once we get persecuted, oh, we turn back to God in a minute. So that's really the whole uh, sphere of that persecution, personally from a church level and historically. Um, but the persecution, as long as we endure it, we're going to get those rewards, and that's what Jesus wants for us. Yeah, Amen, Amen. Again, well said. You covered a lot of ground there, and even took on evolution in the process. So I'll have to jump onto those uh, video clips to check that out. Uh, but uh, again, it's just well done. I'm really getting a lot out of these, uh, you know, teaching videos that you're doing. So keep up the good work. Tell us what's coming next. What's coming next week? What's the next church? Well, the next church is, is, is part two of Satan's plan. As I said, Satan's Initially, when, when Satan, when our enemy wants to come against us, he'll come against us with intimidation and force. And when that doesn't work, and it often doesn't, because again, it usually turns us to Christ, he will, he will use the second weapon in his arsenal, which I believe is, some, is even more potent, and that's compromise. What, he, what, what Satan could not um, achieve through persecution, he achieved through compromise. So we're going to talk about the church at Pergamum, or Pergamus, depending on your translation. That is the church that compromised with the world. And that church is compromising. The failure was so deep, we even feel it to this very day. Yeah. So next week, we're going to find out what that comes from. It's going to be a, a longer episode because we have to, have, there's a lot of ground to cover. But we're going to find out what happens when the church compromises with the world. Well, that's great. We'll look forward to that, Ed. And again, fantastic job. Great to be with you. Everyone, make sure you subscribe to faithbyreason.net you know, click like, uh, check out these videos, track with us week by week. You're going to keep growing and getting a lot out of this that you can apply to your life now, but it's also going to give you this wonderful context, this of, of Christian history, if you will, as God had laid it out early on in these writings to the churches. God bless you, brother. God bless everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to you next week. Okay.